Good evening all, and welcome. I hope you're feeling hungry for tonight's set of stories. I would also like to thank our collaborator for tonight, Deadly Cure. He's an incredibly talented narrator, and I'm sure your vocal work will have you checking him out once this video is over, as his custom link in the description and at the end. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My parents are divorced, and I switched off between parents every Monday. My dad just picked me, a 15-year-old female, up from my mum's. It was around 11.30am, and I hadn't eaten lunch yet, so my dad suggested we go to Panda Express. We get in the drive through and I hear the usual, Hi, my name's Rachel, how can I take your order? It didn't sound like a robot, she sounded human, and my dad tells the woman our order, and she doesn't respond. We sit there for two minutes before my dad asks, Hello, are you there? But there's no answer. And we sit there for another minute before pulling up to the window to see if there's anyone there, but no one is. We see no one in the restaurant. The lights are all on, the window is closed, and the computer is on, but no one's there. We sit there for another three minutes to see if anyone walks in or out, but nothing. My dad claims he saw someone walk in, but I don't know about that, considering the fact that we saw no one in the restaurant. We joke around, saying how the store is getting robbed, or the people in there got murdered. But after a few minutes of joking, we realise that those are very real possibilities. My dad calls 9 my mom to report it, and see if they can check it out. And we ended up going to Lee's, and getting a few burgers. After we drove back by the Panda Express, we see people peering through the window and trying to open the doors. The doors were locked and they couldn't get in, but the store was open. It wasn't like it was closed and we just came at the wrong time. Five and a half hours later, we drive back to look at the Panda Express. The police aren't there. There's still no one in the store and people are at the drive through line just sitting there. We drove by five times each time and we saw no one. There were no workers in the kitchen. Cleaning, no one. I still have no idea what happened, but I think there was a robbery or a murder or something. The entire thing was bizarre, and I'm pretty sure I heard a woman's last words. There was nothing on the news, and we didn't get an update. Several years ago, I suffered a small stroke, which I was lucky enough to walk away from, at only the cost of many of my long-term memories. It fragmented that part of my meat hard drive, to the point that I had to relearn much of my teenage and early adult life from photos, and exposing myself to those people and places again. Sometimes, my memories are spans of imagination to bridge the gaps. I remember my family in patches, up to my teenage years, and not so much between my second year of high school and my mid-twenties with gradually more detail as I reached my 30s, up to my 40s where I have no problems. Sometimes, it feels like I've never seen the first few seasons of the television show, which I'm the star. People just pop in like they were always there. It's often frustrating, and it doesn't help that my experience makes me more prone to spikes of anger. I don't live where I lived in those dead patches of my life, so there are literally hundreds of people from that time who exist as either ghosts, abstract feelings, or not at all. I visit the hometown every so often to put flowers on my parents' graves and try to remember when and how they died. I keep in touch with my estranged sister, whose memories of family are tainted by her bad experiences and resentment toward our parents. My only window into that world is through my younger sister, who I wouldn't keep up with if not for our shared family. She lives in my old hometown, and our age difference is such that we knew many of the same people. Most of those people have moved away, but some planted roots less than a mile from where they grew up. For some reason, those are the people I know best through talking to them, even though they probably play little or no role in my real life. People will approach me every so often there, and in my own adopted city, and I'll have no idea who they are. 
People sometimes get mad at me for insulting them that way. I've had ex-girlfriends slap me and walk off angry because they don't understand my situation. Some think it's a joke. Sometimes it's sad, but other times it can be downright scary. I was sitting in a pizza joint, working on something among the lunchtime crowd, when someone sat down in the empty chair opposite me. I looked up from my work and automatically began the process of threat assessment and identification. For me, it has become a practice. Usually, it's someone I know and I'll act like most people. If I don't immediately recognize the face, but they seem to know me, I'll try and index them in my patchwork brain somehow. This was someone I didn't know, but might have seen many times. Older, 50s, male, stocky, grinning with confidence, leaning on his elbows, leaning forward indicating acquaintance with me. The eyes are familiar. My index traces that to a feeling of unease. He's not an ugly person, but his gaze is severe. He wears a suit here like it's a costume, because his posture isn't good for the cut of the blazer. That smile is not entirely pleasant, except that he's trying to make it seem so. This process took me about three seconds, which is just long enough to seem like an awkward pause, because he says nothing at first. He just waits for what I guess is an automatic reaction. Now, I'm in the pre-COVID crowd, pressed in close enough to smell the entire menu and overhear a dozen life stories of woes if I had wanted to do so. So I'm not feeling threatened, but uneasy. After a few seconds, I actively stop blinking to see how long it will be before we start this conversation. He breaks and goes first. You don't recognize me, do you, Jimmy? His smile broadens, and I can't help but admire an expensive rack of teeth that I think might be more appropriate inside the head of a mule. The skin over his forehead wrinkles, carrying two plucked but pulp eyebrows along the slope. This helps me because nicknames are great context clues. My parents called me James, my colleagues and current friends call me Jim. My sister calls me Jimbo Dumbo because she's an ass. Only people from back in the grey zone of time called me Jimmy. My sub-processor brain keeps working. My face neutral, I replied with the usual. Sorry, no, I have a bad memory for faces. That smile is trying to split his lips off his face. His eyes narrow to a severe degree, and they glisten with tears pressing out between the lids. He blushes hard, like I'd slapped him. It's honestly creepy, but proves my abstract memory of this clown is accurate. Yeah, I didn't think so, Jimmy. This is you now, huh? Not sure what to say to that. He's starting to hold himself together, putting pressure on his eyebrows and bringing himself across the center of the table with his bullet-topped crazy person face nearing the edge of my laptop screen. That flimsy barrier gives me a little comfort, but not much. This is me now? I'm in a suit minus the jacket that I left in my car. I'm 30 years, 50 pounds, and a lifetime of experience beyond whatever the hell he's thinking of, as then. But seeing how he's wearing a suit that he probably digs out only for job interviews, weddings, and court appearances. Looking like he's either seething or suffering from impacted bowel, I could easily dismiss the air of contempt in his statement. I said, I am me as I always was, I guess. This was the best that I could do, while my brain worked on giving me something to work with. He says, I didn't think I'd ever run into you again, Jimmy. I bet you hoped I never would. What? I thought. I just told you I don't recognize you. Practice this in the mirror, did you? His face is not in my nightmare directory. He's not one of the dozens of images that I only see in those lucid dreams that mix fantasy with suppressed or fractured memories, usually about bad people or events, a breakup, 
losing my parents. A couple of bad beatings I suffered in school from students at the local clown college, but this wasn't anyone there. He said, I heard you got sick. Did you have a breakdown or something? I said what I was thinking. Clearly you're not an old friend. What do you want? Instead of splitting off his skull like a hot kernel of corn, his face suddenly went slack. His cheeks fell and his brow unraveled. The eyes, still narrow, softened to consider my response. I can't even tell if you're messing with me, he said in a low grumble. He sat back and planted his palms on the table, eyes scanning the dusty rafters of the pizza place in whatever the hell he was on about. It was the way his right pinky bent against the tabletop that unlocked something in my head. It was bent at an odd angle. The ring finger was weird too. They had been broken a long time ago and not properly set. It was that and the phantom pain in my cheek and neck that connected the threads in my head, but not enough to give me a name or a place or a time. I just knew he was dangerous. When I get into those rare situations, I have to stave off a panic attack. It's a lot like arriving at work to suddenly remembering you have a big presentation to give, or that dream where you're in finals week, but you never attended class. You smug, selfish asshole, he growled, his fingertips pressed down on the checkerboard tablecloth. If I saw you anywhere else, on the street, in an alley, back home maybe, behind the school, I would end you. That last part drew with it some ancient hatred that broke past the practiced facade that he perfected in front of a mirror for probably many years. There was something evil but honest on that face, reflecting a truth in his heart about me. In front of me was a mystery from inside the dead space of my past. My face burned and I held my hands behind my monitor when they started to tremble. Something about this guy's face displayed all the bad men in my life that I had forgotten. All the hidden dangers among the enemies I may have made and forgotten. It's like I slipped on the skin suit of some kid who died at 23, and while that kid may have met this guy, and clearly not hit it off with him, the skin suit's current occupant had literally never met him before. Under less hostile circumstances, I would have tried to explain that my gaps were not chosen. I happen to remember a Thanos snap of memories from certain times in my life. I only know certain people existed in those gaps because I have a sense of object permanence that suggests they came to me from somewhere. All I could do was shake my head slowly, maintain eye contact, and watch for sudden movements. Aware that others were turning into our intimate reunion, the man worked to pack all of his anger back into himself. It was hard, but he managed to put the toxic paste back in the tube and sat back. It gave me a better look at the old suit that fit him better 10 extra pounds ago, the new tie that someone gave him, maybe for whatever brought him to town. His face fell into an expression of disappointment. This was a moment he dreamed of, and it was wasted because of a dozen witnesses. Then, he shot up out of the chair and left the restaurant. He didn't even order, I guess. I sat there, lost for what I'd been doing in the first place. Took my time to stop the trembling in my hand and the sparks in my head, and made my way out to my car. I sat in the driver's seat, still frightened, not about what had just happened, but what I might have done to earn such seething hate from a stranger. A shadow crossed the driver's side window, and I looked up with a start. It was him. He stabbed a finger into the glass. That gesture felt familiar. He yelled, Don't you ever show your face back home. I'll smack the fat right off your face. You hear me? He pounded the side of his hand against the glass but it simply trembled, about as much as I did. And he was gone. 
Surely, something so heinous would be in a police record, right? At least a tale told by people from around that time and place. I had no inkling of such a thing, and no cool story to put a face to. Doubtful. I began to resent the fact that I didn't have the presence of mind to ask a single goddamn question before he bolted. That fuel made my damaged brain fire harder through the mess of memories and imaginings, the based on a true story section of my head that tries to make sense of what I no longer witnessed. Greg, that name jumped out at me, complete with the extra G, making it seem more real. The face was just a flicker, and my need to get more forced me to not think too hard about it. Part of my coping mechanism is to assign values where none exist, making connections for the protection of my sanity, but at the cost of real memories. I have to distract myself from painting in memories and let that subconscious part of my mind work out the facts as best it can. So I went back to work and made an appointment to see my sister that weekend, put flowers on graves and find my old yearbooks. I wanted to go on social media and ask my friends from that time about the guy, maybe creep on their friends' pages, looking for a grinning skull for a profile pic. That's a danger too, as every new face that registers risks becoming a fictional version of itself. Something about boots, snow, these useless reports emerged early, but I was able to revisit them knowing the boots were important to me and that the snow was cold and hard. There was a physical pain associated with these memories too. I also started running my tongue over a chipped tooth for the first time since I could remember. I drank hard that night. While I'm not supposed to, it kills my dreams. That weekend, I met my sister who didn't recognize my description of the man 30 years beyond any memory she could have had for him. I asked her if I ever did anything so horrible that made a man want to kill me over it. She replied that I made her feel that way a lot. Then she asked me to borrow 50 bucks. I was much luckier over golf with a friend of mine who understands my situation and represents a good friend I lost. He is the custodian of many of my memories and helped me recover those first few years. We grew apart because he says I developed a different personality and was all about things in order and following instructions. You went square, he said not registering the irony of calling it that. Did you know someone named Greg from our past who I really pissed off? I described him and explained the conversation we shared. Philip was doubtful, but it took a while to consider it. As he did, I added my random evidence, a favorite pair of boots, winter time and the snow, being thrown into it and chipping a tooth maybe, Philip looked at me, and I could tell he knew. It was before I met Philip, but he had heard about it. I was 15. I got into a fight with some kid named Greg, who just came into the school from somewhere. He was, as Philip put it, a douche. Within a month, he had been expelled. Part of the reason for that was he beat the living hell out of me. It wasn't important to Philip, so my old story about getting beat up on the walk home through heavy snow wasn't a big memory for him, but he remembered the part about the boots. It was winter. Greg had on old sneakers on a long walk home. He walked with an older kid, a dropout called Clyde, who everyone in the neighborhood hated. Clyde and Greg were pretty much kindred spirits in their life-hating rebellion and love of violence. When Philip told me Greg beat me up for my boots and maybe left me to walk home in wet, cold socks, it didn't jog my memory, but it made sense. We continued playing golf and I lost six balls before I gave up on the fairway of the 15th. Soon after getting back to my motel, Greg Kowinski had a name and a face. Google filled me in on the rest. I wouldn't know about the boot story until much later. 
But Greg Kowinski was a convicted felon. He was also on the sex offenders registry. I was, if not the first domino to fall in his life, I was the one that ensured they would begin falling steadily onward. Soon after he was expelled from school, Greg met up with other troubled kids, including Clyde, and began selling drugs. Soon, he was trafficking and working in a warehouse that packed and delivered large quantities. Along the way, he pursued his favorite pastime of meeting, using, and abusing young women. He went to jail for beating a woman at a bar. He dated another woman and went to prison for a sex act with her underage daughter. With doors closing behind him, Greg created an enemies list of all people who wronged him. I know this because it was used in evidence to put him in prison again for stalking his ex-girlfriend. How he was back on the streets and his purpose in the town remains a mystery, but I'm pretty sure I was, uh, am, on his list. One of his many victims who walked home half a mile through snow in thermal socks and whose parents had Greg arrested for it. He knows where I live. I know this because he sent me a message on Facebook that was sequestered because he isn't a friend of mine or connected to me elsewhere. He quoted my address and added, See you sometime. That was over a year ago. I've locked down my social media since then, especially after he started liking pictures of my wife and sister. I hate going home again now. I hate going to the old haunts, even ones in public, because I don't want to see his face. I'm at a point now where the gap in knowledge has narrowed to a point that seeing him again may fill in all the details of the beatdown. Somehow, I think that remembering it frightens me more than the risk of anything he would try to do to me. I'm a 16-year-old girl and work as a waitress at a restaurant. There are a lot of other girls around my age who also work as waitresses. Each waiter slash waitress has a certain section of tables to serve. I haven't worked here for very long, but worked here long enough to manage a section on my own. I'm fairly friendly with my co-workers, so when one of the janitorial workers would make small talk with me, I didn't think anything of it. He'd talk to me fairly often, as I would often see him working in my section when I'd come out to clear tables. I figured it was pure coincidence. I was taking a break in the back room eating my dinner, when the janitor guy walked in and sat down at the table behind me. He sat again, made small talk, literally nothing super important, and as I inhaled my pancakes, one of the other girls walked in and we began to chat for a while. The janitor left about five minutes into me and the other girl's conversation, and I again didn't think anything of it. While I was cleaning up, I thanked the girl for talking to me and she said, Oh, I just came in to make sure you weren't alone. No one should be alone. With him. I later learned from the other teenage girls that the guy had a habit of pestering them, being generally creepy, and following them to their car while he was a middle-aged man. I was freaked out and of course, looking back, I'm 80% sure the dude was following me around while I worked in my section. So to the creepy janitor dude, please get lost. This happened a few years ago when I was 20 in Hawaii. Now I was raised being told that there are creeps and murderers everywhere. So I always have a watchful eye out and even slightly paranoid. I started going to a small group run by the church I went to that took place Friday nights near where I lived. We would meet in a courtyard in the middle of a busy strip type mall. We were between a Jumba Juice and a Starbucks. In the courtyard, there were a few tables around and one big table in the middle. We would always meet up at that big table. One day I got there and notice a man sitting at one of the tables more towards the back of the Jumba Juice building. He looked like he was in his 30s and was Hawaiian. I took no notice of him at first, but started getting an unsettling feeling 
when I started to notice he would not stop looking at me. Where he was seated, any time I looked straight, I would see his face. Now, I've had the occasional creep try to talk to me, but there was something more intense about this guy. I never had a more disturbing vibe come from someone before. I tried to brush it off and enjoy the evening. It was nearing the end of the night, and I started to take my keys out of my bag because I was planning on leaving shortly. When I did that, I noticed the man take his food and throw it in the trash and started gathering up his things. The sight of that freaked me out and I don't think it was a coincidence because then he just stood there when I didn't get up. I ended up staying a bit later because I was talking to one of the girls. I'm about to leave and I look up to see if the strange guy is still there and he's not. I let out a sigh of relief and thought maybe he left but I still felt uneasy, so scanned the area. Now, he had the brightest pink shirt on, so he wasn't hard to miss, and wouldn't you know it, he was standing in the grassy area between the courtyard and the parking lot with his arms folded, just staring at me. I panicked inside, and knew I had to have someone walk me to my car. I stood with my back turned to him, he was probably 50 to 75 feet away from me, and called the leader of the group over to me. I said, do you see the guy behind me staring this way? He's been looking at me all night, and I don't feel safe walking to my car alone. Is there any way your family or someone could walk me to my car? She replied, oh yeah, he's been here a while. He was here when I got here, which means he was there for three plus hours. She agreed that there was something off about him, and she and her family walked me to my car. Thankfully, he didn't follow, and I watched my rearview mirror the whole way home to make sure no one was following me. I made it home safe, but I really thought if I walked to my car alone, something would have happened. I have never had a feeling quite like that before. But wait, there's more. A week after, I went back to the small group. I remember that guy and that feeling I had but didn't think he'd be there. I go to our normal spot, and I was there early, so only the leader and another woman was there already. As soon as I get to the table, the leader hugs me and says, I don't want to scare you, but that guy is here again. So I look over to the table he was at last time, and sure enough, there he was. I tried not to freak out inside, but I was totally freaking out. I talked with the girls while we waited on the rest of the group. In that time, I must have had an uncomfortable look on my face and glancing in his direction because both women turned around and looked at him. The older woman noticed that he had a clear view of me, so she scooched her chair to where she was blocking his view of me. Bless that lady, but that didn't stop this creep. He literally picked up the small table he was sitting at moved it a few inches closer, and moved his chair to where he could see me again, all while looking directly at me. This is when I knew there really wasn't something right about this guy. The night went on, and at one point, the creep got a phone call. He went to answer it, and I started walking behind the Jumba Juice building. Before he disappeared completely, he arched his back so he could continue to look at me, while he slowly made his way behind the building. Creepiest thing I've ever seen. Needless to say, I kept an eye on him the whole night, and before I could even ask the group leader, she offered for them to walk me to my car again. I'm sure you're wondering if I ever saw the guy again. Thankfully, I did not. My cousin started baseball practice, and I had to take him Friday nights, and ended up missing out on the small group nights. I still wonder if he was there that third Friday, and maybe even fourth, waiting for me. It wouldn't surprise me. I did go to the small group, one last time a few weeks after. This was a few days before I left Hawaii. I was a little anxious, wondering if he'd be there again, and was relieved when I saw he wasn't. After that, I bought pepper spray. Moral of the story, if you feel uneasy, don't be afraid to tell someone. 
Maybe you think, what if I'm overreacting? And to that I say, even today, I know if I didn't have someone walk me to my car, something would have happened. I was lucky I was with a group of people. But if you're alone, and something like that happens, find a group of women, or an authority figure, and don't be afraid to say what you feel in your gut. It's amazing how much our gut feelings can be right about things. So I was about seven years old when this happened. My dad and I had stopped at a fast food restaurant in a pretty shady area, because he had to use the bathroom. There weren't that many people dining in there, and the restrooms were in the very back, like in most fast food places. My dad told me to stay at the table right outside the bathroom, and that he'd be right back. I wasn't too worried because although I didn't like being left alone, my dad always made sure to be super quick in public bathrooms so that I wouldn't be left alone for too long. But almost immediately, after he went in I felt eyes on me, and noticed there was a small group, maybe of three to five older men, all in their late 50s sitting a few tables away. They were all staring at me simultaneously without speaking, and I remember feeling kind of scared because it was so odd, even as a little kid who didn't really know what was going on. So one of them says fairly loudly, and I remember this so vividly, wow, look at that pretty little girl over there all alone. We should do something about that. And they all burst out laughing. I felt so much dread at this point. I didn't know what they meant, but I knew they were bad. Fortunately, my dad came out moments later. I whispered something to him that I don't remember, but I think he could tell something was wrong by how scared I looked. And without saying anything, he walked out with me, and we rushed to the car. We never talked about it, but after that day, my dad would always take me into the public bathrooms with him. I know this might not be the creepiest story, but it was scary enough that combined with some other experiences, I don't think I can ever fully 100% trust a man to not be creepy or want to hurt me. So, everlasting trauma is certainly fun. I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that has stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm female, currently 20. So basically, to set the scene, I'm an average height, average size 20 year old female. I've been told I'm very approachable, and perhaps too nice to strangers. I sometimes just don't have the heart to tell people to screw off, and I definitely should. Obviously, I'm not going to give specific details, but I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping centre. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping centre itself, and not a store inside, like me. When I was 16, and first started the job, I was quite timid and awkward, and would let anyone say pretty much anything to me. I didn't quite know what to say when older customers and other employees would make inappropriate comments to me. I would simply just laugh off whatever people would say, or not respond. In my 16-year-old mind, this was a lot easier to handle. I had one other friend at my job who was my age, and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had, and one day, she asked me if I'd heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange. She didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling, or even someone to be afraid of, just a very eccentric man. Really, she and other employees would laugh at his odd sayings and awkward behavior. Jessica also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day. Chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior, or harmless flirting, if he wasn't a 50-something year old man, bringing chocolates to a 16-year-old girl he barely knows. I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. 
this machine was out of the view of all the other employees, and the restaurant was empty, so this was pretty much the perfect time for a creep to approach without being seen. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping centre, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he is your typical creepy old loner. He was gaunt, had grey hair with bold patches, and had beady little eyes, which never averted from yours, and I can't get them out of my head to this day. Eric must have sneaked up on me, as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. I could feel his breath on my cheek. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy, are you married? He almost giggled after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face, which made me feel as if he was trying to pretend that he thought I was older than I was, and at 16, I looked 16. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answers to, just to see what my reaction would be, letting me know in his own way that he'd been looking up information about me on social media. He would do this frequently. I began to clock on to the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead, stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following the first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favourite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge, and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favourite, insert band name here, song? Eric relished my discomfort. You could see by my reaction that I was clocking on to the fact that he had been viewing my personal social media, and the thought of that made my blood run cold. I felt disgusted and violated. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was by going through my Instagram page. This creeped me out majorly, but somehow I just forced myself to forget all about it and carry on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable, and he liked this. This is what he wanted. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that Eric had followed her in his car on her walk home from school, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people, it seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had travelled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me, and this manager informed me that a few years ago, Eric was rumoured to have followed a young girl, who used to work for our restaurant, into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep, yet still employed at the shopping centre, on one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason, but on the other hand, I was frightened as he'd been doing this for years, yet no one had stopped him. Anyway, there was a woman that worked at the same place as me called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, and he asked her for her phone number, and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her texts with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And, Rebecca, are you sat on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here? I was stunned. This was quite slowly turning into a nightmare. 
I was constantly questioning why this old man was so hell-bent on finding out everything to do with my life. Why me? He had gone out of his way to source information about me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. Again, this creeped me out, but still, for some reason, I forgot about it and carried on with my life, which was very hectic at the time, and in a way, I'm grateful that I didn't have the time to dwell on Eric's growing obsession. However, this was something I wouldn't be able to ignore forever, as Eric began inserting himself into my life in ways I couldn't just ignore or brush off. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I must have tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favourite film, because it's a great film, right? Anyway, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face, and the same usual wave of disgust washed over me. He was really making a point to let me know that he was watching me. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. To someone hearing this story, it may not seem as unsettling to you as it did to me at the time, but when someone is going out of their way to make sure you know that they know information about you, you spend every waking hour thinking about what they plan to do with this information and why they insist on taunting you with this knowledge. The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. This was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric Stanley, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word, from Eric. He literally found my PayPal account and sent me three pounds with a quote from the movie attached to it. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous calls, incessant calls, one after the other. I was in floods of tears and ended up having a huge panic attack. I felt there was no escape. My phone rang and rang and rang all night. I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued and every time my phone would ring, my head felt like it was being impaled with the sharpest knife in the world. I was completely on edge. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, making a point to breathe heavy. I even swear that they were trying to sound like they were pleasuring themselves, which sickened me. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the lengths he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, and hurting me or my family? That night, I had horrific dreams in which he chased me around my house and taunted me for hours. I still have similar dreams and struggle to sleep without my boyfriend present, as I'm scared he's standing right outside my door to this day. I reported Eric to my managers and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to the statement, and added details of times that they had witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior, or times he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center managers, yet nothing was done, except for the fact that he was warned not to talk to me, Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog, or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he had outsmarted me and found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved cities as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. I still thought about Eric every now and then and when I focus on it for too long, I can't be alone.
out of fear that he still keeps tabs on me. The thought of that terrifies me. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot all about the twisted little man who used to obsess over me at my old job. I forgot he existed, but I was soon going to remember. On Christmas Day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed, and I expected it to be another message from a friend or a family member, but I was wrong. I received a notification from PayPal, and it was the exact amount of £3. Only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognise at all. I opened up the PayPal app, only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, Sending on behalf of Eric. My blood ran cold again. I had forgotten all about this man, and all he had done to make me feel unsafe and unsettled. And here he was again, antagonising me, yet this time, doing it through other people. Perhaps his way of telling me that him being banned from talking to me himself won't stop him from entering my world. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with my family until I forgot about the notification. I probably should have told someone about it, but I just wanted to do as much as I could to block him out. I didn't want him to control me anymore, and I since hadn't seen or heard anything from him, and I wanted to stay that way. I think Eric still works at the shopping centre and lives local to me. I avoid my old workplace so I don't have to see him, and he doesn't have to see me. So to the creepy, beady-eyed freak that made me live in fear, let's not meet again. Once my husband and I went into a restaurant that was laid out in an L shape. The order counter was in the front, short part of the L, and the seating in the back the longer part of the L. This happened in Visalia, California. We were far away from home with our three small kids visiting my mom in the hospital when we stopped for lunch. We chose to sit all the way in the back of the L shape. There was a large mirror on the back wall, so I sat facing it. There were big glass windows near us facing the parking lot. We were almost finished with our meal when I noticed an extremely intense, angry looking man coming directly towards us from the parking lot. It was weird because there was no entrance close to our table. Right away I got a very nervous, sinking feeling, which I tried to hide from the kids. It was almost as if the creep knew we were there before he saw us. He stared right at us with an angry face and furrowed brows from the outside as he stalked towards the bend of the L shape where the entrance was. I elbowed my husband and quietly told him to be on alert. The man took a seat at the table behind us without ordering food. He sat there scowling directly at us. We could see him in the mirror. I got the feeling we were in his seat. Nervous fright waves refracted from my body as I tried to keep my cool. Hubby and I gathered the kids and herded them outside. They were all under ages five and below. The man stood up and followed us to the exit, then halfway through the parking lot. My husband whispered to me our only plan. If the man accosted us from behind, we would turn on our heels and ram him physically to knock him to the ground. I'd call 911 while my husband would sit on top of him. This nutcase. Thank heavens the angry man stopped and returned to his seat at the restaurant. Perhaps he feared someone else may take his seat. We set a new world record that day for strapping three kids in car seats and screeching away down the street. This happened in 2007 or 8. One night, me, my friend Jason, his girlfriend Lisa, and his friend Adam decided to go to Denny's around 11pm or so. We walk in, and Jason starts talking to the host, when his girlfriend starts talking to these two dudes sitting close to the entrance, eating some midnight breakfast, one of whom was very drunk. We see what's up, and she tells us that she knows the sober one from back in high school, and they caught up for a second. 
After about 20 minutes into our meal, the hammered guy starts making a bit of commotion and we notice him looking at us angrily. Lisa goes up to the friend and asks what's up, to which he says that his drunk friend thinks that we're laughing at him. We weren't. He causes a bit more of a ruckus and the sober guy escorts him out. A few minutes go by and I notice out of the window that the truck they got into was still there across the lot, so I decided to keep an eye on it. It finally left after about 15 minutes, but only to return to the other side of the lot another few minutes later. I let Jason know, and we kept an eye on it as we exit the diner. No movement, nobody even in the seat. Now we know something's up, he's obviously ducking down. As we pull out of the lot, we see the lights click on and slowly make the turn to follow the four of us, all in the same car, out of the lot. We turn off onto the street and feel the car jolt and a loud bang. It took us a second to realize this guy just rammed us. To give perspective, we're on an empty road in an old Honda Civic, being rammed by a guy in a large pickup truck Naturally, we gun it as fast as we can, trying to make as much noise and commotion that we can produce, hoping to catch the attention of a cop. We're running red lights and doing 90 in the 45. All the while, this guy is repeatedly ramming and bashing the back and sides of the car. Finally, someone in the back gets an idea. I'm calling Eric. Eric was a longtime childhood friend of my best friend. He was uh, well known in the crime world, in our area, we will say. I get on the phone and tell Eric what's happening, and he tells me to run from the guy, and he'll call me when he's at the McDonald's near the area, and for us to head there once he calls. We ride for about another five minutes when I get the call and tell Jason to head to the Mackie D's. It took seemingly forever to get there, but I was so relieved to see the big M just around the bend. We turn the corner to the lot and see Eric and what seems to be 10 to 15 people with him all standing near the entrance. We slam the brakes and hop out of the car as fast as we can, ready to deal with the situation. As soon as I look up, I see Eric toss a four-way tire iron through this guy's back window. The dude doesn't even pull into the lot all the way before pulling out and taking off. We see lights in the distance and Eric and most of the people he brought were gone, like cockroaches to light. They were masters at getting away. The cops pull into the lot as we're waving him to keep going or else they'll lose the guy. But to my surprise, the cop jumps out and yells, get on the ground with your hands on your head, while he points the gun in our faces. After a few confused yelling squabbles, everyone calms down and we tell the cop the story of this guy. He tells us that someone inside the McDonald's said that we all had guns. As he's taking our statement and assessing the car damage, he gets a chime on his walkie-talkie and tells me and Jason to come with him in his SUV. We drive about a mile up the road to a local batting cage parking lot that's in a slightly wooded area and we see the truck sitting in the far end. There's a cop pulling the guy out of the truck as we pull next to them he asks us, this the guy? Sure was. They throw him into the other officer's car, and the other cop took us back to Jason's car, where we left and met with Eric at his house after. A few weeks later, we get a call from the department, and they said that the guy was visiting from California, so out-of-state fines, which is like double. The truck he was ramming us repeatedly with was his friends who he was staying with, by the way, not the sober guy from Denny's. He was over twice the legal limit and fled the scene. Needless to say, this guy was up a crap river in nothing but open wounds. He had to pay for all the cosmetic repair, plus the engine, which Jason reported as, quote, clunks and hums now. I got my first job when I was 16 at a Taco Bell, about a seven minute drive from my house. It was a step up from a McDonald's 
and close enough that if I didn't have a ride, I could tough it out and walk or get an Uber, because it would be cheap. I made all my friends working there. I was really shy in high school, and didn't talk to anyone but work was a second home. I felt more comfortable, less judged, and opened up into a new person after working there for a short time. After a few months, our general manager leaves after being hired elsewhere, and we get a new one, Dan, who had been working at another store. He was arrested and had been in prison for a while, and got out and still had his manager's keys and just came back to work. They needed a new general manager at my store, so they switched him over and promoted him. He was kind of weird, but I tried to be nice. I really liked all my co-workers, location, and loved the last GM. So I was trying to make it work with this one too. That's when I realized he was a massive weirdo. He started sleeping in his car in the parking lot overnight. He had a wife and house, was twitchy and jumpy, and had a bad leg he would constantly be limping from, and started stealing bags of tortillas and messing up the inventory. He was just obviously a tweaker. They literally hired out of prison to come run a store. Great fit. I was over it now. I miss the old general manager, and the other managers were between 18 to 21, and a bit hard to get along with. I was thinking of leaving, but was just sort of riding it out, hoping all these people would eventually be let go. Then I'm standing at front counter during a shift. I was assigned to lobby, i.e. taking people's orders, cleaning the front of the restaurant and the bathrooms, and restocking straws and stuff. I'm wiping down a fat stack of trays and just zoned out, when Dan comes up behind me. So you're thinking of leaving? We're all pretty much in each other's business, and everyone told each other everything they heard, so I didn't care that he knew and wasn't remotely surprised. I just said, yeah and probably came up with some excuse about school. Well, if you do that, I'm gonna have to give you a few drinks and put you in my car. What? I side-eyed him. What does that mean? I got an uncomfortable laugh and just kept on wiping. I quit that very next day. I've had multiple creepy encounters in my life, but this one, was by far the creepiest. It happened several years ago when I was 17. I'm 22 now. At the time, I lived in a suburban neighborhood with my mother, who was rarely home, and I worked part-time after school and weekends at a diner. At work, we had quite a few regulars that, you guessed it, came in regularly, but there was this one guy in particular that was different from the rest. He was young, late twenties at the most, tall, lanky, and had a voice, I hate to describe it this way, that seemed very feminine. His name was Mike, and he recently started coming in every Tuesday night. It only took a couple of weeks for me to become sort of friends with Mike. He was friendly, hilarious, and I thought he was quite eccentric, as am I. So we got on really well. There were a few things that struck me as odd. Firstly, he was always making up these stories about himself that were difficult to believe. Secondly, he would come into the diner in the late afternoon and stay there with us until we were turning the lights off. Sometimes I wouldn't get off until 11pm or so, when my entire town was basically shut down and dark. I put all my suspicions away at the time because Mike was a super cool dude. It all got weird when I got my first iPhone. Mike was showing me how to do everything, how to save numbers, make calls, how to download apps. He even downloaded a few for me to get started. I thought nothing of it, and then he started to text me like crazy. It was all normal stuff at first. He would text me about the weather, about his favorite TV shows, and then he started to send me photography photos that he said he took of his best friend. I got a little weirded out at that point, because the photos weren't ones he'd taken. They were obviously pictures that he'd saved from the internet. 
Not to mention, the backdrop for his best friend was unrealistic for the area we lived in. I believe I texted him something along the lines of, you didn't take those, lol, and that's when he started to flip out on me. He started calling me all sorts of awful names, and started to cuss at me, and told me I was the untrustworthy one, not him. I was so baffled, I decided just not to text him back, and talk to him about it next week on Tuesday when he came in. Well, he ended up coming in the next night. I figured he was going to, because the server had told me he called the restaurant around lunchtime to see if I would be working that night. He apologized and told me he was out of line, and we moved on. After a seemingly normal evening with him at dinner, I decided to ask Mike if he was single, because I had this awesome friend, Anthony, that I thought he should meet. I was under the impression he was gay, because of the way he talked about his exes and whatnot. They sounded like they'd be dudes. Mike immediately flipped out on me, yelling, I'm not gay. I like women. Why does everyone think I'm gay? I completely froze. I was so upset with myself that I would falsely assume something so private, and I felt so guilty. Mike had already stormed out, but I texted him shortly after, telling him how sorry I was. That evening, as I was laying in bed, reading a magazine, I got a response from Mike. The text simply read, Where are you? I didn't know how to respond without A. Revealing I was alone at my house and B. Giving him reason to try and come over to my house. So I didn't respond. I was hoping to play it off in the morning like I fell asleep. He then texted me again, saying, Never mind, you're at home. I immediately called my boyfriend at the time and asked him if he would come over and stay the night with me, which he promptly did. I didn't tell him why I needed him to come over, and I didn't tell him that I had a creepy creeper creeping me. I blocked Mike's number the next day. I asked my manager not to let anyone give out my personal schedule to anyone who asked or called, and I stopped working Tuesdays. About a week went by before I had a weird, unsaved number text me. You're mine. I don't care about your boyfriend. It took me less than half a second to realize that Mike had made a new number to talk to me. He started to flood my phone with derogatory comments about me, graphic stories he made up of us in his mind, and this desire for me to break up with my boyfriend. He basically went to stalker level 600, and I noped the situation super hard. I blocked that number and switched to a weekend day shift only, I told my boyfriend about the situation, and he started to stay with me regularly. I thought I had taken care of the situation, until I started to see Mike in random places. I would see him just driving out of the parking lot, after I'd get off work. I would see him driving in the distance while I was getting gas. Everywhere I looked, it looked like he was there too. Of course, I ruled it off as paranoia, one night, I was home alone waiting for my boyfriend to get off work and come stay with me. I got a text from an unsaved number that read, Hey stranger, you home? I then got a few more that led me to believe that he was there too. I ever so sneakily peeked through the curtains in my main hallway to see Mike's car parked outside my house. I started to psychodial my boyfriend until I realized he was pulling up in the driveway, passing Mike on the street. I took my phone to my carrier and had them give me a new number and make it so unsaved numbers couldn't text me. The guy who was helping me asked me if I wanted to deactivate the GPS tracker that was set on my phone. I was completely dumbfounded that Mike had downloaded an app that traced my every move I could see Mike on the map too, and he had refreshed my location just 14 minutes ago. I took a mini leave from work until I finished my semester, and the manager at work handled talking to Mike. My mother and I moved into an apartment on the other side of town that summer. One of my biggest fears is that he never stopped following me, and I just don't know about it yet. Creepy Creeper Mike 
let's please not meet ever again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Huge thanks as always to my lovely and incredible members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. You guys genuinely are the best. Thank you. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Deadly Cure for helping me narrate today's video. It was certainly a lot of fun. Restaurants. It was a bit of a different, different topic than we usually have. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, also, this will be the last narration you hear from me without soundproof paneling. It's going to be installed within about an hour, so that's fun. Tomorrow's video, who knows, might be a bit better. We'll wait and see. I'll let you guys tell me in the comments. But for now, it's time to shine the limelight on Deadly Cure. Thank you for joining us today. And the link is now on screen. And of course, as before, it can be found in the description. I hope you can show him some love as he is amazingly talented, has a wonderful voice. Hopefully, see you there.